thanks everyone for joining today. Um, of course, who are those are on? We're happy to see you on. If you can hop on camera, that's more than appreciated. We definitely like to see some faces. Hey, Samuel, how are you? Um, Wyatt, yes, awesome, cool. So we're going to kick it off. I'll hand it to whoever's going first. I think Lee, maybe. Very cool. Um, so, yeah, basically just wanted to kind of get with you guys, uh, answer some questions and talk about some of the opportunities with Vicious RV, um, kind of run you through a little bit. So um, we'll start with kind of a little bit of who's who. Um, so if you want to go to number two, uh, Kaylee and me and Jake will kind of do some introduction so jake will let you go first because your name's first cool so yeah guys i'm jake stromba i'm a regional vice president with bishes rv uh, i've been in the rv industry for just about a decade not quite um spent uh the bulk of my life working for for one company started working for a small company some of you might have heard of them in 2002 uh advanced auto parts and and way back when we we had 1200 whole locations i think they're up to like 7000 now it was a privately traded company when i started working there and a few years into that it went public and the environment changed um so accidentally uh, stumbled into the rv industry uh, a gentleman i crossed paths with years ago at that organization um Fell in love with the RV industry, went to work for a company called Camping World, and it was on my birthday about 10 years ago. He called me to wish me a happy birthday and said, you, you ought to come check out what I'm doing. And uh, I had recently just quit my job. I was working on the CarQuest acquisition project when we purchased, I think, 1,600 retail locations. So I spent about a year and a half uh, figuring out uh, what locations were going to stay open and what locations were not, and where could we find synergies in between the two companies. So when I got done with that project, I had um, I kind of retired, and I'm like, I, I hope I look too young to retire, um, but I definitely wasn't at the age of, of when I should be retiring. But I set myself up in a pretty good spot, and I had a couple young kids at home that I wanted to spend some time with. So I had full anticipations on taking about a year, year and a half off of work and spending it with the family, and that lasted six weeks until I got that phone call of come check out the RV industry. So I showed up at a camping world dealership um spent three days not getting paid just playing um and since i refused to leave they gave me a job and it was super unique so i left uh, advanced auto parts in a senior leadership role and i started in the rv industry um at what's considered an entry-level sales gig and what's called the bdc and in our world that's called a business development center so i was in charge of all incoming leads and how to distribute them to who, and then what we're going to do with outbound activity and set up objectives to, to close and capture upwards of 3,000 uh, consumers a year through just that program. Uh, so did that for about six, seven months, absolutely crushed it and got into the sales tower. That's where the deals get wrote in the RV world. Um, started playing as a sales manager for a while. And then before you knew it, I was running a dealership. And then within a couple of years, I had multiple dealerships. Um, that company um, had, has its struggles with being so large, and I had an opportunity to come play at Bish's RV, and I think it was pretty unique, the path I took, and I'll take a minute and explain it to you, um, but I, I left Camping World as a multi-unit GM, and I took a position with Bish's RV in Kalispell, Montana as a sales and finance manager, so took a couple steps down, if you would say, um, from a role perspective uh, and responsibility. And I've been with with Ambitious now, March 1st will be four years exactly. And I had the opportunity to really grow Montana into what it is today. And based on the work and effort that my teams did, I will I'll take very little credit for it, but based on the work and effort that my teams accomplished and achieved, um, before you knew it, I was getting phone calls from the president of the company and the CEO and saying, hey, we're going to we're going to give you some more. We got some opportunities for you in Michigan. And I'm, I don't want to move to Michigan. I love it out west. And no, you're not moving. You're just going to oversee this as well now. Um, so hence comes the regional vice president role. So today I'm responsible for all of Montana, all of Michigan. And um, this year it will be our highest volume dealership in the organization. And I'm saying that intentionally just to get Lee fired up a little bit. Um, and that's Meridian, uh, Idaho. Go ahead, Lee. Okay, very cool. Um, 
so a little on my background, um, I had worked, you know, obviously when I was in college and then out of college, I'd worked at a lot of hospitality, um, restaurants, that kind of thing, resorts. Um, most recently worked for the gentleman that owned Bass Pro Shops. Um, he had a big resort out there um, and we opened about a 1200 seat dining complex for the PGA tour. And we did that. Normally that would take about a year and we did it in three months. So moved out here to be closer to family. My family's kind of been in Oregon for a long time. That's where I'm talking to you from right now. And, uh, you know, coming out here, I've done a little bit in the manufacture. So I don't know if you've heard of Zach Brown band or things like that, but I worked at a company that made a lot of custom cargo trailers. Um, and so it was everything from guys with model airplanes to they wanted a, you know, a competition barbecue smoker. Um, back when Orange County Choppers was a really big deal, we made a lot of custom trailers for them to haul the motorcycles. So I've been around that kind of thing, but never RVs particularly. Uh, came out here and I was like, well, that's the big dealership. I have a couple of friends that work there. So I started working here um, and then was the internal manager. And what that means in the RV world is there's kind of two sides to the service department um, in most dealerships, whether it's cars, RVs, whatever. And it's the internal and the external side. The internal is basically you're taking care of dealership needs. Right. So someone wants to buy a trailer, you want to make sure that everything's you know ready and prepared on that. So that was kind of my main role is making sure that customers were getting the trailer that they paid for and everything was ready to be and operational and that kind of thing. So I did that um, with that dealership for about five or six years. Uh, and then Bishes actually purchased that dealership uh, in July of 2021. And we'll get into a little bit of that. Um, but that was it was kind of a wild ride. Um, obviously, since being with Bishes. Uh, I went from being the internal manager to a service manager. Uh, and then from there, I oversee the operations here in Junction City. So it's pretty much everything other than sales and finance. So parts, body shop for when there's a collision or things like that. Um, and then obviously all, any of the customer service stuff. So parts, body shop, and service are the big ones that I'm constantly babysitting. Um, and then they asked me to um, be a mentor. So I'm helping a couple of the other locations that are um, you know, struggling with service, kind of helping them. Uh, kind of get their operations in line a little bit. Uh, and then recently was asked to help with 11 locations. So, um, so again, just some cool opportunities and growth that I've had with fishes, you know, personally as well. So Jake's going to talk to you about uh, the big three. And so, real quick, uh, Kaylee, if you don't mind, because we do have Nathan's special guest. I know his name wasn't on the screen, but can he intro himself real quick? Good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my name is Nathan, like Jake said. Um, I'm actually pretty recently started here at Bish. So I graduated last year from Oregon State. Um, I was a supply chain major. Um, and I think I think I reached out to Kaylee because of career fair or something like that. Um, and we just got kind of set up and I actually met with Lee at location at Junction City, which is about 40 minutes from where I went to school um, and kind of just got hooked on the industry and the processes and kind of what Bish's values were. Um, before that, the summer prior, I had interned at Toyota's regional headquarters um, up in Portland, so kind of doing all aspects of that business, and I enjoyed enjoyed the industry. I just didn't want to travel as much as they wanted me to, so um, yeah, I kind of just fell into Bishes, and then um, somehow I got a hold of Stromba, and he convinced me to move out here to Montana, so I've been out here since June, and uh, yeah, having fun. I run the, the internal department here, so kind of like Lee said, um, in charge of all our inventory, making sure it's ready for sale, selling. So, yeah. <clears throat> and he's very, very modest in what he says he does. He does a lot more than run the internal program. Nathan's uh, part of our, our AMP program, and he's working on a lot more than that. Uh, Nathan keeps up what he's doing, and he's probably going to be one of the youngest GMs we've ever had in our organization. So that's up to him to to make that happen. We're, we're all cheering for him. Um so yeah, as Lee said, we're going to talk about the big three real quick, uh, compensation, upper mobility, growth, and culture. And when we talk about compensation, one of the reasons I, I think I love brag on it so much, and, and a lot of folks, money isn't everything, being being happy is, right? Um, in, in the RV industry, specifically at Bish's RV, we've figured out how to make them both wildly important with culture and compensation. Um, I never in my life... Um, envisioned myself when I was your folks age working in the RV industry I didn't know it was a thing um, and, and we find that it's the best kept secret in the entire universe um, we have human beings that work for us that that have 
hundreds of thousands of dollars invested into college and they make equal amounts of money. And we have human beings that work for us that didn't invest money into college and through grind and uh, perseverance have figured out how to master this industry and get into very high level roles within our organization. I believe, um, so my boss, the VP of ops, I think he started in this industry as a receptionist. It's kind of a cool story. And he's running a pretty large, not pretty large, the largest family owned multi-dealership operation in the United States of America. And it's fun too, guys, when we're talking, we cannot say United States, we can say universe because we're the only country in the world that sells RVs. So it's pretty fun. Um, universe, biggest family owned organization in the universe. Um, in the way we're able to, to play that compensation game is, is based on the way we pay our people. Um, so there's a lot of roles within the organization that aren't, there's not a lot of roles. There's, there's a handful of roles that aren't really revenue driving roles. And those ones pay well, typically a base salary um, and, and nothing else. But the bulk of our roles in our organization are, are going to pay something of a base salary in a very, 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 healthy and more than fair, usually uh, variable pay compensation. So we pay you for exactly what you're worth and, and how hard you execute your job and how tenacious you get after your goals. None of our pay plans are capped. So as long as you keep excelling past your goal, you keep getting paid on top of that. It's pretty special. Um, as far as upward uh, mobility and growth, the sky's the limit. Um, I'd say, you know, four years ago when I joined the, the organization, that was really coming in on the ground floor of building a skyscraper. And we're probably only about four or five stories tall at this point. Um, I think it's a very fair way to, to paint the picture. Um, anybody coming on now who, who truly wants a career, and even if you wanted to find a place to retire from, this could be that for you. And I think, you know, Lee's story is a prime example. What Nathan's working on right now is a prime example of upward mobility and growth um, in, in me, how I got to where I am today. I was tasked with running um, the sales department of one facility for the organization. And, you know, six, seven months into the role and with my background, I was capable of doing more. Nobody necessarily asked me to, but I realized that our sister store about 200 miles from us was struggling and I started spending some time over there. That's the Great Falls location. Um, and one day, all of a sudden, my, my pay stub changed. And it didn't say sales and finance manager anymore. It said GM of, of Kalispell and Great Falls, right? Um, and I didn't envision that happening so quickly either. About a year after that, um, I got a phone call from uh, Todd Nuttall. He's the, the current president of the company. And he said, hey, what are you doing next Monday? And I said, uh, probably playing parts manager. I got a parts manager out sick with COVID. And, and I come from the parts industry. So I like dabbling in that world every chance I get. Um, and he said, well, no, I'm not going to have you playing parts manager on Monday. I'm going to need you in Bozeman on Monday and Billings on Tuesday. I bought you two new dealerships. Uh, going to need you to go run those for us. And I, I've already explained to you guys and girls how we got to um, the Michigan locations as well as Meridian. Um, the sky is the limit. As we dig into culture um, and how we can really brag on compensation and say that money is important and that culture is important, the harder we work, the harder we play. I've never worked for an organization that goes out of their way to make sure that we, the leaders of the organization, go out of our way to have fun, not only fun with ourselves, fun with our teams, and fun with our families. Um, every year we do an incentive trip. Uh, the top performers in the organization get to go somewhere really cool. Uh, last year, I uh, believe I had a drink with with uh, um, Lee in, in London um, at a, an award ceremony, right? A uh, year before that, we probably threw a high five somewhere in Mexico. Am I right, Lee? Um, and then before that, I think we were probably hanging out in Costa Rica. And the year before that, we might have been in Hawaii on a beach in warm water. Um, we don't stop playing. Um, and as far as that goes, um, the fun factor is it. And that's really driven from Troy, the owner, and, and his wife, Stacy. Um, not uncommon. So with my role, and you heard Nathan mention that the job he had before um, dictated a lot of travel in his life, and he didn't want that. Every job I've ever had has dictated heavy travel for me. 
it's not uncommon for me to get home after being out on the road for eight days, two weeks, three weeks, whatever it may be, depending on how dealerships are operating, um, for me to get home and, and hear my wife had a conversation with my boss or my boss's boss, and they were just calling to check in to make sure I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing as a father and a husband, while I'm also doing what I'm doing for the organization. It's an incredibly special place to work with a bunch of uh, equally impressive leaders. Yeah, very cool. So on that kind of culture topic, um, this is sort of the other half, like you said, I mean, it's not all about money. It's about the people you work with and how people behave, you know, every day that you show up to work. So this is a small portion of what we call our playbook. And our playbook is what we call a living, breathing document, because obviously things can obviously change over time. And then, um, you know, there, there are, you know, some revisions to things, you know, as we get better, but this is a, a couple of the key pieces of that. So the, the top is what we call our North Star, and that's above that little gold arrow. Um, and we call it, and basically it's the place that employees choose to work, customers choose to shop, and that vendors choose to partner, right? Because in every business, you know, there has to be a choice, right? You, customers have to choose your business. And if you're going to be a worthwhile organization, you have to have good people. And the other thing that a lot of people don't think about, how do you treat the people that you're doing business with, right? So in maintaining those good relationships, we want to be the company that is sort of our guiding light, right? And then everything else sort of builds up to that. So at the base, like Jake was talking about, the culture is huge, right? Um, there's, a, there's a saying that, um, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So you can have the best ideas and have all the best software and the best fanciest shiny buildings and showrooms, but if your people aren't you know, happy and if they're not doing a good job and if they don't feel like it's a worthwhile place to work, they're not going to engage. They're not going to be a part of it. So culture is a huge, huge part of any successful company. And that's not something you can just you know, spend your way to. You really have to take care of people and be genuine um, you know, to obviously have people go, you know what, this is a pretty cool place. You know, I'm going to put forth my best effort and I'm going to try. So that's really kind of the underpinnings is that culture. And then on top of that, you see what we call our four pillars. Um, and the concept there is any successful company, you have to have balance. And we believe the balance in those key elements, you know, it really everything kind of sums up into one of these four things, right? Whether it's a new piece of software, whether it's something, you know, whether it's an employee's idea, but employee development, you know, we want to take people like Jake was saying and take them from, you know, a receptionist and let them become a general manager or a regional vice president or a whatever it is, right? And some people are motivated to do that on their own, but also there's people that, you know, you kind of have to reach out and help and say, hey, you know, you're, looks like you're struggling. Let me help you with that. Let me show you this. Let me teach you that. So there's trainings that we go to. There's all kinds of different, um, you know, resources the company gives us to, to learn about new areas of the business. So it's not a thing. So you can basically learn for the next job and you can learn for that next position so that when that comes available, then obviously it's, hey, this person's the obvious choice. Um, innovation. Uh, innovation, obviously, whenever anyone says that nowadays, a lot of people think, hey, that's, you know, software, it's computers, it's automation. And it certainly can be, right? But innovation, um, one of the great examples is there was a technician that we had, and instead of walking from the front of a big fifth wheel to the back to check to see if the brake lights are working, he put up a mirror in his bay, right? Very, very simple solution and saved the entire company a bunch of time with about a $2 mirror. And so it does not necessarily have to be AI. It does not have to be, you know, a new piece of software. You know, innovation can be literally anything to make the company more efficient, to make the customer's experience better. It doesn't have to be technology. And so we, we'd really like to stress that. Customer satisfaction. Um, there's a, obviously a lot of companies out there that, that live for a little while and they don't take care of their customers and you don't hear about them anymore, right? So you've got customer satisfaction is absolutely huge. Um, we have a lot of different things. We have what we call our NPS, um, and that is honest surveys from the customer. We literally tell them we want you to be completely honest. You know, we're not fishing for perfect scores. We're not fishing for, hey, you know, tell us everything we want to hear. We want to know what didn't you like, what didn't go the way you expected it to, because we really genuinely want to improve in our processes so that the next time you come back, we nail it. And so we, we can tell them don't pull any punches we want to make sure that you're happy with with everything we did um profitability um some people you know oh big company making profits it's a dirty word 
But at the end of the day, obviously it's not, right? The company has to be profitable to pay payroll. The company has to be profitable to take care of customers. We have to be profitable to keep lights on and doors open and, you know, have give people a way to feed their families. You know, it has to come from something. So those are really the four pillars. The core values are the things that we say 95% of the time the company does on its own without being reminded. So those are being genuine, obviously being authentic, right? You're not putting on a front or being two-faced or anything like that. Um, fun, like you talked about, you know, I got to go to London, Mexico, Costa Rica. Um, you know, they've done trips for a long time, but those are the ones that I've been a part of as long as the company's been around. So fun is definitely a huge part of what we do. And then being driven by results. And again, the, the thing under there, driven by results, it might come across a little rough, but it's factual if you think about it. No matter how good we feel about our team and how noble our cause, if our organization rarely achieves its goal, then by definition, it's simply not a very good team. And again, it sounds like, oh, that's a little rough or that truth kind of stings. But if you think about it, it's true. You know, if you have a team, it doesn't mean it's a bad thing, right? Because if you have a bunch of people out playing, let's just say basketball, you know, you might be having a great time. But if you're not winning games, you're not really a championship team, right? So there's definitely results and it can go two ways. It means that something might not go the way you want, but did you learn from it? Did you improve on it? So driven by results doesn't necessarily mean we have to win all the time. It just means that when we do get a bad result, then we're paying attention to it. We're learning from it. We're talking to each other and we're saying, hey, how do we keep from you know repeating this bad result over and over? So it's kind of looking at that. Um, and speaking of being performance driven and the results, that's the next one, and I'll let Jake do that one. Performance driven with amazing perks. We talked about the aggressive compensation plans, and they are, and I think we have some charts a little later on so you, so you folks can see exactly what those are. Um, I, I've already kind of explained the rapid career growth and extensive career paths. So well, I guess I didn't talk about the past, and we'll get into that in just a minute, too, with the AMP program. Um, the annual incentive trip for top performers, it's a real thing. It happens every year. Um, if you choose to come work for this company and you choose to, to put forth your best effort and your best effort is better than the top 10% of the organization, you will see yourself on these trips all over the universe. We go everywhere. Um, health, dental, vision benefits. There's a lot more that goes into all that, um, but we are ultra competitive in that world. I actually had a a doctor's appointment I had to go to the other day for what I thought was a slight emergency. It wasn't. Um, it cost me $10 to, to go in and leave. So um, pr pretty exciting about that. Uh, 401k match up to 5%. And I don't know if we do a great enough job talking about what up to 5% means. Most companies, um, when you earn a bonus, you don't get to match your whole 5% of your bonus. Um, in our world, there are human beings in our organization today that, that recognize $20,000, $30,000 bonuses a month. Um, and you get to put your 5% match against those bonuses as well. It is not, I just saw Trevor's eyebrows raised. It is not uncommon um, for folks in our organization um, to have their max uh, 401k contribution um, be well before the end of the year. Most places you work, they cap it in other ways. So if the IRS says you can only put in, and I don't know what the number is today, but I think it's around 21,900, something like that. Kaylee might have the exact number that you're allowed to put in and your company is allowed to match. It's somewhere in that ballpark. It changes every year. Um, but our, our, our team members typically are hitting that max contribution six, seven, eight months into the year. Um, also your social security deductions, where a lot of us are able to get into that and quit paying into that much earlier too. Um, life insurance, if there's some company funded stuff and then there's some stuff that you can buy on top of that. Um, since I've had children and, and they are starting to grow up on me, one of them's 14 years old, um, you start thinking a lot about who's gonna take care of them if something were to happen. I travel a lot. Um, what if one day I didn't come home? Um, based on our life insurance policies that, that they have just to cover me that I don't pay extra into. And then the ones that I do pay extra into that, that Troy also has a match. Troy's the owner. We'll, we'll keep reminding you of that. Um, if I weren't to come home ever again, my family will be 100% A-OK -okay for the rest of their lives. And that gives me peace of mind in life. 
uh, gym reimbursements. If you're healthy and you like going to the gym, we'll pay for that too. You just got to prove it real quick with your bill and your visits and your gym will we'll fill out a little form for you. You send it in monthly and they reimburse you for your gym memberships. RV borrowing program. This is pretty fun. I actually got a call this morning on it from a service advisor of ours. And, and he said, Hey, I want to borrow a motorhome. How do I, what do I do? Um, and it's, it's exactly that. If, if you're leaving work on a Friday and, and you decide you want to go camping Saturday, Sunday, you can get with the GM of the location and the sales managers pick out any used piece of inventory we have on the lot. And there's a lot to choose from, I assure you. Um, and you can take it for the weekend. You can take it for a week. If you want to wrap up two weeks of your vacation all at once, you can take it for that too. Uh, Thanksgiving before last, I stole one. Uh, it was a current model year, um, 2022 Jayco uh, Greyhawk. Um, me and my family took it and we drove all the way across the United States to central New York from Kalispell, Montana to have Thanksgiving dinner with my mom and dad. And I just thought it would be something cool for the kids and the wife to see what I do every day. And I'm not traveling in an RV, but um, they, they get a little taste of what we get to play with too. Um, the team culture, we work hard and we value that hard work as we've been preaching since we've been on this call. The harder you work, the more you'll be recognized through praise publicly uh, by your direct supervisors and most importantly in your paycheck. Very cool. So we talked a little bit about, and I was telling telling the team here on the call, um, in 2021, you can see they had 14 locations. So on this map, I'm the yellow dot all the way on the West Coast over there in Oregon. Uh, that's kind of where Nathan was hanging out. Um, so the thing like Jake was talking about is we're on floor number four or five. Um, you know, when I was part of the organization, this dealership was the thir lucky number 13 uh, that they bought. And you know, we've grown, you know, you're constantly getting an email. Hey, we just bought something in Texas. Hey, we just bought something in Michigan. Hey, we just bought something in Indiana. And it's like, man. And the whole concept is they, they definitely control the growth. Um, you know, they're very disciplined in that. They want to make sure that we don't get too big too fast and that our processes are good. And, um, you know, the people have training and that kind of thing. But the reason we're on this call is, you know, we can only grow as fast as we have good people. Right. So if we buy dealerships that we don't have good people to put them in, then it really doesn't do us a lot of good. You know, we need people that are driven, that are hard workers, that are performers, that can, you know, that's the other part of this. As you can see, if I joined at number 13 and I'm doing what I'm doing, you know, and here we are at 23, then obviously, hey, we've got more. We need, you know, a, a West Coast VP. We need someone to look over, like he was talking about, Montana or Michigan or, you know, as we get more stores. So, in a perfect world, yeah, two, three hundred dealerships, obviously, you know, down the line, you know, bigger if we need to be. Um, but that's we really got to make sure, like I said, that we have good people in the seats um, that understand the business, that work hard, that are performers, that can drive those results. Um, and a big part of that is, you know, teaching the people below you. Hey, this is what I did to be successful. How can I help you? Let me teach you this. You know, someone someone taught me when I first got here you know, let me show you. And again, being helpful to, to those people that are coming on, you know, after you. So. All right. Uh, you've heard us refer to the AMP program a little bit and what AMP stands for is Accelerated Management Path. Um, and we're pretty excited about it. Uh, and I'm happy Nathan's here because he is in the middle of it right now. Um, and, you know, interestingly enough for, for us, and I'm not an a RV insider, right? I just joined the industry a decade ago. Um, but prior to that, the only way to really move up, it was to accidentally get a job at an RV dealership, right? You accidentally walked into one or some, somebody recruited you by accident. Um, and you typically started out on one side of the business or the other. And when you start out in the sales side of the business, you typically propel yourself, if you're a performer, up through the sales side of the business, maybe maybe into a GM role if you can wrap your head just a little bit around service. There's been some mistakes made in the industry with that career path. Um, there's a lot of moving parts in service that the sales-minded individuals never wrap their head around on the way up. And typically, if you start on the service side of the business, maybe it's in a technician role, an advisor role, um, a detail role, whatever it may be, the typical path was always up into the left that direction. 
what we've been able to accomplish with this accelerated management path over the last few years, and, and Nathan's actually dabbling with the crossover portion of it right now, and I think it's really fun, um, we're able to get uh, very smart, talented, hungry individuals in the roles. Um, we're able to pay them a solid base pay and an opportunity to earn some bonus money and dabble in multiple different departments. So each dealership, um, you folks might not be aware, but there's realistically four separate P&Ls with inside an RV dealership. An automotive dealership is going to be structured very similar. You have a sales department, you have a finance department, you have a parts department, and you have a service department. And they all kind of operate as their own business. And we do have individual P&Ls for each one of those that flows through all the way down to one single P&L. And when people come on specifically like all of you and what Nathan's working on right now, Nathan's been working on that. Uh, what, what's the role we have you in today, Nathan? Internal project manager? Internal project manager, yep. Yep, so if you go all the way down to the bottom of the mountain here, you'll see he's on the bottom of the mountain. And we're, we're to the point in our lives where Nathan's come up with some really great ideas and, and some things that maybe people from outside of the RV industry would have never thought of. And he's got to get some really unique results in a very quick time frame. Um, Nathan, you want to share with them the the phone call you got about the middle of December <laughs> and what that was like? Yeah, was that a Monday night? I think it was. A... Uh, it was. A, it was a late night for me. We were there till like <laughs> two in the morning, but I think it was like ten p.m. when we called you. Yeah, so I was at home with my wife eating dinner and uh, get a call from Jake Stromba, which you got to answer. I asked him what he was calling me for, and he said, what are you doing tomorrow? Kind of like, uh, I guess, Todd asked him a few years ago, and I said, I think I'm going to work, right? <laughs> Not knowing if I was getting fired or something. Um, and he said, well, what would you think about hopping on a plane tomorrow morning and going to headquarters to do some finance and sales training? So I got the opportunity, hopped on a plane at like 4 a.m., landed in uh, Idaho, where our headquarters is, and got to sit in on like a whole week of training for sales stuff, which was all new to me because I've been on the service side. So just a lot of opportunity to, to learn things has been pretty awesome. <clears throat> yeah. And, and that opportunity is available for anybody that wants it. So Nathan's in that internal project manager role right now, and we're kind of dabbling and, and he might not even know this, but we were talking about him a lot yesterday. And, and do we start playing more heavy with the other roles in service or do we start stretching our wings over to the sales and finance side of the business? And, um, so he has uh, Nathan's boss, Sam Bickle. He's a multi-unit general manager. He runs Cal, or I'm, I'm sorry, not Kalispell, Great Falls and Billings. So Sam's perfect vision is to have a guy on the ground that can only one voice coming up to Sam instead of five different departments speaking to Sam, right? Um, so I think that's the role that Nathan's working into now. And it's going to be uh, that dealership general manager up on top as he bounces around through these over the next probably six to eight months, um, mastering all of them. Uh, super exciting. As you see on the right side of the screen, um, I, I've talked a lot about compensation. Um, I am one of the people that do actively believe and acknowledge that money buys me happiness. Um, I'm not afraid to say it. I got really cool toys. I got boats. I got guns. I got trucks. I got Jeeps. Um, and, and I can't have all that stuff without money. Um, so if you see the breakdown over here, if you were a senior manager in hospitality, you'd make about 150 grand a year. In auto sales, you'd make about 217 grand a year. Uh, if it was a business career, it'd be about 172. If Bish's RV, our senior managers, make about 278,000. Um, and, and I think it's important to keep in mind when we talk senior managers within our organization, um, we're not talking about me. We view the way we operate our business. And when we say bottom up, we mean it when we say it. So a senior manager is going to be that dealership general manager. That's the senior leadership of the organization. Um, I'm really just a support role that helps keep all those folks out of lawsuits and fun stuff like that. Um, Mid-level managers, um, very similar. You're going to see ten to $15,000 swings, us versus um, the automotive. Um, and then early on in your career is just getting started. Um, very, very similar uh, pay progressions. Our, our average employee makes $66,556.65, sorry, a year. And I don't know if there's many businesses in the world that can say that. Our receptionists get paid very well. 
our detailers get paid very well. And there's a method to the madness. We don't get paid unless we sell and deliver RVs to consumers, okay? And we can't sell or deliver RVs to consumers if it's not clean. If it doesn't work, if a technician doesn't do his job, we can't sell it to a customer. If a detailer, arguably the lowest paid human being in the dealership, doesn't do their job, I don't get paid, Nathan doesn't get paid, Lee doesn't get paid, and Kaylee definitely don't get paid. With that being said, it's it's a circle, and there's a there's a really cool game you can play within a dealership. Um, and if the for those of you that do uh, choose to join ours, you'll see the game at some point in a leadership meeting or whatever. And it's a ball of yarn, and you pretend the ball of yarn is a customer, and you start off with the entire dealership standing in front of you, every human being in there. Um, uh, Meridian has 98 employees. JOR uh, 100 and 50 something lee i don't know the number yeah so, it's like 160 ish 160 employees and one customer walks in the front door even though each employee might not touch that customer every employee has a part in moving that deal or that customer forward and when we say the ball of yarn trick so what you'll do is you'll have all the employees standing around and you'll pretend the end of the, the ball of yarns a customer and by the time everybody does their job for that one deal Every single human being in the dealership has touched that at some point, and it's a giant cobweb. It's crazy. So the way and the reason and the rhythm as to why even our lowest level employees get to make more than some of the highest level employees at some organizations is because everybody's role is that important, and we value that. Absolutely. Anything else you want me to touch on that, Kaylee? Hold on. Sorry, what did you say? Do you want you to touch on? Is, is there anything else you wanted me to touch oh. on? That. No, you did it more than I thought you were going to. I'm very happy. <laughs> you guys got a lot of information today. Yeah. Um. Okay, cool. So these are some of the opportunities that we have available besides our accelerated management path. Um, we also have a leadership development program that once you are high performer in your role, um, you're asked if you'd like to join. And there's a series of tasks and checklists to help you kind of go through that. These are the opportunities that we have for those who are still in college or trying to figure out what they're doing with their lives. Um, we have an internship program. It's typically going to be a summer opportunity for most folks just because you're going to be in school normally in the fall and the spring semester. Um, there's no specific start or end date. If you want to start in May because school gets out in May and you want to go all the way to the first day in September of school, we're cool. We'll work with you with that. Um, we do have a business project that is part of that. So once you're getting in there and you have the conversation with the dealership on where we think we could utilize each other in a partnership on where you're looking to learn more, where the dealership can utilize your skills to help their business run on the day to day, um, you'll kind of figure out where you think you can dive in to be able to provide some additional things. So just some other, I know Nathan, for example, I don't think we touched on it, but he came up with, he had a business project. He was a little bit different situation, but he literally came up with a sticker system that was just like one of those moments where you're like, that makes sense. Why did we do that before? The little things like that as you spend your summer with the team. Um, it's going to be very different day to day. This is a paid opportunity. It's about $20 an hour, of course, depending on the demographic of what dealership that you're interested in. Our externship program is something that is a little bit new. We haven't fully rolled it out with a student yet, but it is an opportunity to go through what we call our employee roadmaps. You're essentially going to go to the dealership that is local to you or wherever you're willing to you know, get yourself there, pay, pay yourself to get there, house yourself while you're there. Um, it's a week of your time. You're going to sit with each department within a dealership to see how they function individually and then as a whole, you can walk away at the end of the week and say, hey, this is a place that I can see myself or maybe not. Maybe this isn't anything I thought I wanted to I want to go into. Um, very structured schedule. It's going to be dependent on per person and what that week looks like for the dealership, but it's more way more structured than our internship. And this is an unpaid opportunity. So more of a shadow experience, but again, giving you an insight on what the dealership looks like on the day to day for a full week of your time. And then lastly, we have our full-time dealership positions. If you want to scan this QR code or you can go to bishescareers.com, this shows you what is up and live currently as of today at all of our dealerships. And then before we kick it off with Q&A, I just want to mention that you'll receive a post-session <laughs> survey today. Um, 
So lucky, luckily for all of you, we don't have like a huge crowd, which is great because you have a higher chance of winning the gift card. Um, the cool thing is that if you refer anyone to our next info session, so we actually have one next Friday at the same time and then the following Friday, March 8th, if you refer someone, whether you're on again or not, if you want to hang out with those leadership people too, um, you get to enter those ones as well, whether you show up or not. So make sure to refer someone to check out our future info sessions. Um, okay. We'll kick off some Q&A. And then this QR code is, if you want to have more conversations with us, that sends you to my schedule link and we could have a one-on-one -on -one to get to know each other a little bit deeper and maybe what you want to dive into in terms of um, employment with Bishes. But other than that, we'll kick it off with any questions. Um, of course, we have Nathan on the call who can answer any questions specific to the college recruiting process and what he went through or just any others that you might have. And remember, if you got specific questions for Nathan, even though I'm here, he's required to be genuine. So he's not allowed to tell you lies. <laughs> Anything? I don't know. I can't see the Q&A if anyone's typed in the chat or not, but nope. I actually have a question for Nathan. So you went through the service side AMP, is that right? Yeah, I wouldn't say I've like gone through it yet. I mean, I'm I'm in the middle. Or you're in the process of it. Yeah, yeah. So I I'm here in Billings, which is one of our smaller stores. Um, so I get I get kind of the the pleasure of running my own kind of little team over on this side. Um, we actually have a split shop, so we have two different locations with different shops, and I get to run the internal one. Um, but yeah, I've started to get. I'm in a bunch of training to learn the sales side right now. Um, we actually partner with a college, so I have a college course once a week right now. It's 10 weeks, um, so learning, you know, management skills and stuff like that. But yeah, I started on the service side, but I'm now starting to dabble over into the sales and finance side as well. <clears throat> gotcha. And what would you say has been your, like, the most impactful part of that experience so far, or like the most helpful to you as you continue to advance? I would say the most helpful thing that's kind of allowed me to, I guess, shine as a, you know a hard worker is my they they allow you to do things experiment with new processes and that sort of thing if it doesn't work hey we tried it and we learned from it but if it does work that's awesome and lucky for me i guess the couple things i've changed here have worked and uh, we've had good results so um i had a question also for nathan but i guess for anyone too this could be um for but you guys talk a lot about all these learning opportunities that you have and the chance i'm thinking of nathan specifically when um you went on this trip and you got that learning opportunity um when you come back how do you learn or use what you've learned from these opportunities in your day-to-day -day work yeah, I mean, so the thing I went to was it's designed, I think it happens once a year, right, Jake? Yeah. So it's kind of like a workshop for already our service or our sales and finance managers. And I kind of, for me, it was more of a um, get me into it, I guess. So for me, it was probably different coming back home. I came home with a bunch of, we got a whole packet of the process and why we do each thing. Um, so for me, I came home with a lot of study materials, but for our finance and sales managers, they get to it's really good for them to all meet together so that we can hone down on processes, what's worked for us in the last year and what hasn't. Um, but for me, it was just getting the ball rolling on the sales side because I hadn't had a ton of exposure to it yet. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And to, I guess, just to build off of what you said, um, when you start learning these new things and you start developing your new skills, do you feel how, I guess, do you feel confident after such a short period of experimenting with these skills? And if you don't, how do you, um, your coworkers, how does your support system kind of help you to really build those skills to the point that you need them to be? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I would say, you know, there, I would definitely say I'm taking on a lot of new information very quickly, but the, the accessibility to my team, like I literally have the president's phone number and I can call him if I need to. I got Jake's phone number. He can always answer for me. Um, Sam Bickle, my, our GM is a super good resource. Just bouncing off those people that have all the experience is by far the best asset that I have as far as being able to learn and walk through. You know, we run into so many different situations that um, there's no way to know it all within a year. So having those resources of people that have all this knowledge, very big asset. <clears throat> yeah, and I guess on that, just to kind of give you a little more information there, 
um, Tristan. The big thing is, you know, someone like me, where I'm I'm managing a team of about 80 or 90 people. Um, you know, Jake is I report to a general manager, and then Jake oversees some, you know, a group of general managers. So in the business, someone like Nathan comes to me and says, Hey, you know, I want to try this thing. It's like, okay, you know, what are you thinking? Right. Hey, I want to do this because of this. Hey, that makes a lot of sense. Let's try it. So it's not, there's never to kind of answer your question as far as the confidence. I think the confidence comes from the fact that you're not going to get punished for trying something, right? It's like, hey, we talk about it. We figure out, hey, this is this is worth trying. And that could make sense for the business. You know, like Nathan said, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a bullseye every time. But it's, hey, appreciate you thinking about it. You know, oh, man, I was sitting on the couch watching TV and, you know, the light bulb came on. Fantastic. Let's give it a go. You know, and then no one on Jake's level is going, what the heck did you guys do? Why did you try to, you know, don't, you know, you didn't ask anyone. You didn't get approval. It's not an act of Congress. There is not red tape. It is 100%. Yeah, absolutely. You know, pull the lever, pull the string, you know, see what happens, right? And then like Nathan said, we adjust. We talk about the driven by results where we go, oh, that was a bad result. Like, let's try something different. Or, hey, that was an absolute bullseye. You know, they're doing it in Montana. Now we're doing it every store across the company. So that's very much, everyone's encouraged very much so to play with that kind of stuff and experiment with, processes and ideas and systems and things like that to make, you know, customers better, employees more efficient, all of those kinds of things. So the confidence, I guess, comes to from you're never going to get punished for trying a new thing. You're never going to get an angry phone call. There is one caveat to that, Tristan. <laughs> There's one caveat to that. And it's, it's the team, uh, Nathan, Lee, all of us, we have full autonomy to go come up with the craziest ideas the only rule is that we fail extremely fast. Does that make sense? So we we pay our people too much money, right? Our, our RVs cost too much money. Average cost of goods on the ground in Billings, Montana right now, and it's got one of our smaller inventories, but the average piece of inventory costs me about $40,000 to sit on that lot. And, and those are all on a loan through a bank through what's called a floor plan. You can all learn more about that in the future. Um, but it's 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 a loan that costs about seven percent a month for the cost of all the units sitting out there. So if there's two and a half million dollars sitting there, and we're paying seven percent of it, and we make a mistake that takes months to identify, it costs thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, however, on that same topic, I have personally in the RV industry made mistakes me that would put small businesses out of business. Uh, my my biggest one to date is about a two hundred thousand dollar mistake. And I realized it was happening. We're not going to get into what it was. Realized it was happening, solved it very quickly. Um, already had half the money recouped before I told my boss. I wasn't hiding it from my boss. I was waiting until I had a full solution to share it with my boss. Um, and that conversation was super unique, just like Lee referred to. It was, what the heck did you do that for? Well, we looked at this. We did the math on this. It made sense, except we forgot about this. <laughs> And as soon as we realized this was happening, we're 200 grand in the hole and we shut it off. We went back to what it was and we moved on. How long did that take you to identify? About two weeks. Cool. What'd you learn? We're going to try it again. What? <laughs> we're just going to change this. And, and the, the response is almost always go. So fail fast. <laughs> Tristan's actually... I've had the pleasure of speaking with you before. It's interested in if it's still the same or Traverse store for an internship this summer. So Tristan, you have the pleasure of meeting Jake already because he's over Michigan stores. <laughs> and Traverse City is beautiful, specifically in the summertime. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Kind of going off um, on the innovation side of things. Sorry about that. Um, do you guys do Kaizans or Kaizan improvements in the company or is that kind of like just a way you guys say innovation? Um, yeah, Jay, correct me if I'm wrong here. So yes and no. I mean, it's not like we hire an outside consultation company to come in and do that. Um, but I guess the, the most specific thing of kind of the Kaizen, um, you know, minimizing steps, maximizing efficiency on time manufacturing, that kind of thing. Um, the biggest thing there is kind of with our parts department and without making it too boring or getting into too many numbers 
uh, in a perfect world, if I buy 100 widgets, right? And yeah. in a, obviously a large business like this, you're typically paying on your account every 30 days. So if I buy 100 widgets and I pay them, let's say $100,000 and I keep them and I sell them slowly over the course of a year. Well, that's dandy, right? If I make, if I sell them all, make my money back, cool. The best thing you can do is buy 10 widgets, sell them over the course of that month. The company then comes around 30 days later and says, okay, it's time to pay your bill. And you're paying that bill with the money from the widgets you just sold and then keeping the extra from the sales. So that is very much what we do. We look at that a lot, especially like Jake was saying, because RVs are so blasted expensive. And right now on average, you're paying about 7% per RV. So you definitely want to get the stuff in, get it sold, pay the bank back, you know, retain your profits and then move on to the next thing. So yes and no, uh, it might not be like the automotive kind of, there's there's not automation with RVs because they're so different. Um, you know, if you're talking Toyota Corollas, you know, for all 27,000 of them, you know, the alternator is the same, right? RVs, there's probably 120, 140 different floor plans per manufacturing line easily. So, you know, that's the whole point is they they are laid out different. They're, the interiors are different because people like different colors, you know, all those kinds of things. So it's not like an automation heavy kind of Kaizen, but you are constantly looking at the efficiency of how you're operating with your inventory, how you're operating with your people, um, to make sure that you you don't have more than you need and it's always there when you need it. And I wonder, Lee, what I wonder if you share a little bit about what you've experienced with the way you managed work orders or the way you, the dealership managed work orders before it was Bish's RV versus the plethora of ways we've changed how we manage them in sure. the years you've been with us. Oh yeah. No, so um yeah to, to Jake's point there. It was pretty normal for us to have about 1,200 open repair orders. And what that looks like right now, we run about 400. Um, and the biggest difference there is, is as a dealership, you're looking at what they call WIP. And WIP is work in progress, right? So that is essentially a loan that the company makes to itself, which is a terrible idea. Um, because you've paid technicians payroll. You've paid for parts inventory. And we still really haven't gotten around to calling the customer to get the money for that yet, which is a terrible idea for all of those reasons. So we have drastically reduced that number um, to about $330,000 from, so 1.2 million, got all that collected. Now we're at about 330,000 because you're going to have some of it, right? Because it's not like an oil change where you're in and out, but that number has gone from a huge, huge number to a much smaller number by making sure we have the right parts on hand and not a whole bunch of stuff we don't need that, yeah, we'll probably eventually get around to selling. Um, but again, through that speed, through the efficiency and through some other programs that the company is actually piloting uh, where they do like a virtual uh, diagnostic with the customer, like a very similar, like a FaceTime, uh, where we're actually getting a lot of that process started for the customer. So when they arrive in the dealerships now, we're ready to fix it. We're not then starting the parts ordering process and the manufacturing authorizations it's all done when they arrive. So some pretty cool stuff that they're doing there too. Thank you. Yeah. Good questions today. Any others? Dial in. Okay, well, we've kept you for almost an hour now, which is not surprising. We always have go over in these, which is awesome because we get to have a good conversation back and forth. But um, thank you all for joining today, guys on our team. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate your time. Like I is on the screen right there is a lovely QR code. I'd love to talk to you all one-on-one um, -on -one to see where we can take the conversations and see if we can find you a spot in our dealership or corporate, whatever works best for, for each of us. Um, but I really appreciate your time today and I hope you have a good, good rest of your weekend. And if, if anybody wants to pick my brain off topic, get my contact information off of Kaylee. She'll be more than happy to share my cell phone. I'm available for, for one-offs as well. Yep. Me too. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay.